This is Life, Body, Business, Impact with Fatima. Welcome, friends. I am so grateful to have you here. I'm your host, Fatima Ingalls, fitness expert, best-selling author, lifestyle entrepreneur, founder of the Life, Body, Business, Fit Systems, and co-founder of the amazing Freedom Retreats. My mission is to positively impact 10 million lives, to inspire you to wake up and live from your bucket list of dreams instead of waking up one day with a bucket list of regrets. Get ready to be inspired with weekly episodes and interviews that disrupt your thinking and motivate you to build your best life, body and business. To change one life is to change many. So come with me now and let's get started with yours. Hey friends, I'm back with another interview and today I'm grateful to be interviewing Glenn Manton. For my footy-loving Australians, you know Glenn Manton from his Carlton football days. For my international friends, Australian football is not the type with the round ball. We call that one soccer and I do believe Glenn did play soccer at some point in his life. Glenn is a former professional athlete having played over 200 football games for Essendon and Carlton in Australia. He's the author of Put Your Damn Phone Down. He's a media personality and professional speaker, making appearances on the footy show, various morning shows, Foxtel programs, and a bunch of radio shows too. In 1999, he co-founded White Line, which is a not-for-profit organisation assisting youth in crisis within the juvenile justice system and beyond. He's also a father of three children who I know he dearly loves and a six-foot-two lover of vegan food and vegetarian food. He also loves standing in front of people and making them laugh. Now, Glenn is someone who thinks outside the box when it comes to life, and this is what I find really interesting about chatting with Glenn. So without further ado, Glenn, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's so great to have you here. I'd love for you to, for us to start this off with you telling our listeners a little bit about your background story and and maybe how a young Melbourne boy came to play footy for AFL. Well, I'm going to let you take a huge breath after all of that because that was an absolute mouthful and you've made me sound vaguely impressive. So thank you very much for that and thank you for having me on your podcast. How did I end up playing AFL football? Well, almost by default. I was, uh, I guess, gifted in the space of swimming as a child. I grew up with a pool in the backyard, which at that time wasn't terribly common particularly to have a big pool and an in-ground one at that so I spent hours and hours and hours swimming in the backyard and uh, developing my techniques across all strokes and when I wasn't in the pool I was throwing a tennis ball against a wall so your listeners already can imagine this party loving good time boy from the age of five through to probably 15 I don't think I even said hello to a girl I was too busy swimming laps of a pool and throwing a tennis ball against the wall because my other great love was cricket and all I wanted to do was be a wicket keeper for Australia and at the time Australia had a wicket keeper called Rod Marsh who was short fat stumpy and had a rather large moustache. And so I, I didn't really have much of an inclination towards any of those traits, but the idea of standing behind a, a set of cricket stumps and being a wicketkeeper for Australia was exciting. So I uh, practised that skill ad nauseum, and uh, many of your listeners would have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, which describes, and I don't know if it's fact or fiction or just simply up for debate, but you have to have done something for 10,000 hours to become an expert. Well, I certainly was an expert when it came to swimming and throwing a tennis ball against a wall, but my passion for cricket diminished. I turned my attention to baseball. I fell away from swimming because that just became quite a chore, just chasing a black line up and down a pool. And uh, my world was turned upside down when I was asked to go to America and pursue baseball. But that time in my life was a bit tumultuous in terms of my personal life and the things that I was doing behind the scenes uh, in a non-sporting sense. And by default, I fell back to football. So there's a long-winded rabbit hole to begin us with. Uh, But that's how I found my way to football. It wasn't really my first love, nor probably my greatest skill. Wow, so many sports and some that I didn't even know about. I thought um, you've been involved in basketball and soccer and footy, but I had no idea about 
you know, the baseball and the swimming and the cricket. So typical young Australian who loves sports. Yeah, I think anyone, and again, you mentioned your international listeners, anyone who's grown up in Australia in the 70s, 80s, 90s in particular has certainly changed into the O's and, and now into 2019 with the advent of technology, grew up in the streets of Melbourne or country Victoria and, of course, the uh, adjoining states and territories playing sports. It was something that was just mandatory and every young person did it, whether it's by themselves with a brick wall and a tennis racket or with a group of friends shooting a basketball, kicking a football, whatever it may be. We are or we were the sporting nation. I'm not sure that we hold that title anymore because there's a huge rate of obesity and a huge rate of disconnect in our community now, which is a huge shame because Australia is a special place and sports held a very special place in our hearts. But that seems to have eroded to some extent. But certainly when I was growing up, there was a case of get out of school as quickly as possible and get into some sort of sport for the rest of the day until the sunset. Well, that actually brings me to your phone. It wasn't the next question I was going to um, ask. And your book, Put Your Damn Phone Down, because we were quite an active nation. You mentioned the um, obesity rates in Australia now. So this podcast is all about life, body and business. So I'd love to talk about um, why you decided to write this book, Put Your Damn Phone Down. You're in schools talking to lots of teens since you've um, released this book. Talk to us a little bit about it and what was the driving reason for you to write this book? Well, my background's in education. I've been teaching and uh, working with youth for a long, long time since my early 20s. And uh, from that point forward, it expanded into becoming a professional speaker, particularly specialising in the area of education, ed- education and youth. So for me, this book was a resource that I felt was necessary to develop. To be quite honest, the title is a little bit more catchy uh, and I guess uh, I guess pointed rather than being actually factual. I, I'm not asking people to put their phones down as such. I do think the phone can be a useful resource. I just think we access it too much and we don't access it creatively and particularly where conversation is concerned. We're not prepared to step away from our phones. And when I say we, I'm just talking about the the general masses. We all make that mistake from time to time. We see our phone as being more important, the upcoming text message or whatever it may be as being more important than the person that we're with. It's a mistake that we all make. We shouldn't just centre that on young people. Uh, So I wrote the book as an adjunct to my speaking, as something obviously the parents and teachers can see as a resource, a, a starting point for conversations with young people. And of course, for the young people themselves to be able to access the stories from my life because my life has been very broad. It has had many, many highs and many, many dark and and gloomy lows. And they're all packaged in this particular book along with 50 provocative questions designed to create conversation, to allow people to disconnect, to reconnect. So tech, the world around us, we have to find ways and which we can make the mesh more effectively. I think more often than not, the tech just falls on a Tuesday and we're expected to understand it by Wednesday and by Thursday, we have an issue. So the more we can share, talk, grow together uh, as a community, as a, as a nation, if you will, let alone right around the globe, uh, the, the stronger those relationships and, and personal development opportunities are. And look, for, for your listeners now, whether they're global or, or local, I'm not the sort of person who's about to preach anything or try and wave fish above one's head and do some sort of rain dance. I'm not into that sort of stuff. I'm rather pragmatic, which is quite strange for most people to come to that realisation because they see me as being so left of centre. But I'm very pragmatic. So it's not about trying to force it upon anyone. It's not about trying to lead that horse to water and force them to drink it's about presentation saying here's an opportunity here's a resource here's something that may help you if you choose to access it it's there in front of you yeah I think there you've made some really really great points there and it absolutely is a conversation starter as we were talking before we started recording it's started some conversation between myself and my middle son once he read it um yesterday aiming to do you know disconnecting to reconnect and getting those conversations started he said to me he's a child that doesn't really like to read mum 
it's really different to other books. It's got some really interesting things. Um, it's not boring. And I did actually offer him money to read it as a way to, to get him to that. <laughs> and it worked, but he wanted to keep on reading. So that's really, really great. And I know that you're in a lot of schools talking about it. So it's obviously um, having an impact. Yeah, look, it really, it really is. I, I love the fact that your son has identified that there's places and parts of the book that interest him. Uh, it's important, I think, with our young people that we're not being prescriptive, we're not being demonstrative, we're looking to build and decorate where possible. And that comes in many different forms and obviously reading, increasing one's uh, acknowledgement and attention and uh, intelligence in turn is something that we really, really need to share with every young person because to have a, a nation of zombies wandering around thinking everything's a little bit too hard, everything's, uh, I guess, inconquerable is, is very, very difficult for us all to succeed. And more often than not, we really do succeed on the back of our youth. So your son may have taken the inclination to pick up some extra pocket money yesterday to read the book but I hope moving forward he sees that you know, not everything is is potentially as the cover would suggest and sometimes a flick through allows you to uncover all sorts of little gems in life whether it be a book or even a com well even better I would suggest a conversation with a, another human being because we are a, a walking library. Yeah we absolutely are and one of the parts in the book you talk about social media or real world personalities versus offline personalities um, mm. as someone else who I've heard speak before Vickers has said um, real reality versus virtual reality mm -hmm. and the way we are living our lives through social media I'd love for you to talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on that look I think knowledge itself is the absolute key to life uh, relationships communication obviously fundamental but understanding who you are what your core values are, what you're prepared to stand for, where you're prepared to work towards in life and why. These are all fundamental questions. And I think the more questions of this ilk that you can answer, the more effective and stronger and resilient and, and, and I, I guess, more rounded human being you become or are. So for our young people, I, I just love the idea that my book or any other resource, any other experience can help them develop that knowledge of self. And I think social media really clouds that space. And like anything, it's not for everyone. And yet everyone seems to want to play the game and uh, uh, try and engage with that particular space and the forums that it provides. I personally know that it is just not for me and my life would have been absolute hell as a uh, 17, 18, 19 year old trying to juggle social media. I mean, as a man, as a grown man, I've uh, tried Facebook uh, because of an old manager's suggestion that I needed to be on Facebook. I gave it a real go, so to speak, in inverted commas. I uh, gave it uh, probably two and a half, three years, but I'd had an absolute gutful by the end of it i couldn't stand another second of it i'm just hanging on to instagram which i thought when i first came across it was a wonderful platform the idea of sharing photos uh, really appealed to me i like the idea of photography in general uh, not that i claim to be any good at it uh, but that's just become a case of one-upmanship and glorified advertisement etc etc in in the most part so I just find it really, really um, frustrating and saddening that so many young people get caught up in the bubble that is social media. I think things are manipulated beyond uh, any, any reasonable level in that space more often than not, even if it's just a cunning uh, use of an emoji or whatnot to make people feel like they're missing out or your life's tracking along more effectively or uh, they're not actually trying to sell you something. But here, you know, check this out just on the side as an aside and I, I find it it's just quite desperate and I, as I said I, I'm all about seeing young people succeed and, and building them up and decorating them and um, enjoying their success so to see them cut down uh, through social media and also their own vulnerabilities is very very frustrating. And look, most people listening to this podcast would have been bullied at some point in their life if not by themselves and 
thankfully for a lot of us older people, and of course, if you're listening, you're over the age of 30, you're old, uh, you didn't have to worry about going home and getting more repetitive messages or stimulus and so forth. And it's all well and good to say, just turn the device off and step away. But when it's become an ingrained part of your life, as it has for so many young people, uh, it's very, very challenging. And I often think about my own life as a child or as a young person, how would I have been if I knew there was a damning letter or an exciting letter coming in the mail? I would suggest I would have gone out to the the letterbox, you know, 10, 20, 30 or 40 times a day to wait for that piece of information, even if I knew it was going to be bad, because sadly that's human nature that we're so quick to want to get that stimulus to get that response that answer that will push forward for it even if it's not such great news so uh, the idea that young people are betraying themselves i think is true in a in part but uh, i think the system is one that's uh, betrayed them to begin with how do young people i guess not just young people but adults because there are so many adults of various ages that don't know yourself so you mentioned earlier knowledge of self and communication and how we become resilient. My son said to me, um, only my eldest son only earlier this week, you know, I still don't know myself. Someone said, just be yourself. He might kill me for this, but you know, he was he liked <laughs> and he wanted to ask her out and he's talking to me about dating advice and all this sort of stuff. And someone said to him, Well just, you know, just be yourself. And he said, How can I just be myself, Mum, if I still don't really know know myself. I still don't really know who I am. So get caught up in this whole virtual world. From my perspective, I share stories. So when I work with young people, I, I again, work in a non-prescriptive, non-demonstrative fashion. I just share stories. I listen conversation. I listen carefully. Uh, listening to this podcast, you wouldn't think I listen carefully because I can talk underwater with a mouthful of marbles. But I do listen very, very careful, uh, carefully to people. I'm very observant. I try and take my time when I'm listening and I'm observing and I'm not afraid to ask questions. And that's been a part of my personality that I've hung on to since a very young man, the desire to and the want to ask questions and to ask good questions Ask questions that might be challenging, questions that might raise an eyebrow, respectful questions, but questions nonetheless that are provocative. And I enjoy doing that because that tells me a lot about a person or a situation or a time. And I can take that away and I can digest. And I think that's another important skill to develop too, particularly for young people, just being able to find time. Maybe it's on a walk with a dog. Maybe it's using music in your room. Maybe it's just during a gym session or whatever it is that you find a a distraction or a place of calm to digest what's been going on in your life, what you've heard, what you've seen, what you've learned, what you think you may have learned, what you need to learn. And this is a constant updating process. And it always makes me laugh when I get the notification from Apple that my phone's ready for an update. And I think to myself, the human being should be continually updating itself or oneself trying to find the next level the next opportunity to grow and obviously they're skills that take time to develop but there's no better time than the present whether you're 15 16 18 22 29 uh, or as i am 45 to continually update the systems and consider values consider ethics consider the world about you and how you fit into it what are you bringing to the world around you all that might sound heavy to a listener but they're actually just small systems checks you observe something, you think about that person's behavior. Uh, as I'm recording this podcast, I can see an open door. Uh, my philosophy would be if I walk through a door that's open or closed, I'm going to look behind me to see if there's anyone else coming and I'm going to hold that door open for that person. That is how I'm going to live my life. And in this moment right now, I can just do a system check. Am I happy with that behavior? Is that how I can wish to continue to act? Yes, it is. If I come across somebody who doesn't uh, go about that particular, uh, I think, uh, ingrained, innate human uh, obligation, if you will, then I might just remind them it's important to hold a door open. And I'll do so in a way that I hope 
provokes them to say, yes, yes, it is important and, and I will take a moment for somebody else and support them. Now, that's not to say that I'm a perfect human being. I'm traveling in traffic across Melbourne as we record this podcast. I may give somebody the bird uh, in my car as they cut me off or beat the horn. That's fine too. It's it's just a matter of being able to, again, do a systems check and say, was that really worth it? Did I really need to do that? What was that about? Are you grumpy about something else? Was it really that big a deal? Maybe it was a big deal. Maybe it did deserve a, a bit of a beep on the horn and, and a, a, a show of the finger. But the point is, I'm trying to evaluate my actions. I'm trying to better my actions. I'm trying to maintain a level of integrity that sees my personal development always on show. It sounds like you believe, you know, in continually trying to be better and not to compete with anyone or to live up to anyone else's standards, but a standard that you hold within yourself. And would it be true to say that, you know, you, that standard is continually growing and changing? Absolutely. You, you nailed it in one right there. It, it is about living up to your standards. Of course, you're going to get stimulus from other people, people that you admire or people that you've seen from afar that have done something extraordinary. But uh, there are people who, who have been able to climb Mount Everest. I have no interest in climbing Mount Everest. There are people out there who have billions of dollars. I have no interest in billions of dollars. There are people out there who go from township to township healing the sick Mother Teresa style. I have no interest in being Mother Teresa. So you quickly realize where your interests lay where your benchmarks lay according to other people and and also your own experiences and then you develop oneself from there it is a complex conversation if you are 16 to 18 potentially listening to this podcast just as a, a small bracket of example then it may sound a little confusing it might sound like wow this is a, a very simple complex action and in many respects it is but it's not a, it's not beyond a listener who's taking this in at a younger age or for that matter any age it's just something where you have to develop your own framework you have to feel very comfortable and as you said create those benchmarks that you're comfortable at, at trying to obtain uh, the idea that I was ever going to get 99 uh, 0.4, I think it is the highest score for VCE uh, during my VCE or HSC year. It was just never going to happen, not because I wasn't smart enough. I just wasn't interested enough. It, it, what school wasn't something that was going to provoke me to the point where I wanted to get 99.4, but I damn well needed to pass. I knew that. I knew I needed to pass. I knew I needed to get to university. I knew I needed to take the next step. So working with an integrity towards that, is what I chose to do. And the young people out there, again, listening, not everyone has to be an engineer or a doctor or a football player or a teacher. You have to aspire to being the best you can be. I, I remember uh, a young person that I came across who was a beatbox uh, exponent, somebody who was really, really good at making those incredible guttural sounds that translate into a, a musical tone out of their mouth. And my advice to him was, if you're going to do it, do it properly. If it's where a real passion lays, you must evoke that passion and run with it because I can't be a big box exponent. I can't make a career out of this, money out of this, but you can because you clearly have the skills. Now, I, I really should do some investigation and see where he has taken that skill because at the time he was crowned the second best uh, beatboxer in Australia. So this is an integrity, a, a benchmark, a skill set, a knowledge of self, an ability that he has that he should choose to run with if that's where his passion really lies. Yeah, I think um, everything you said is absolutely right on point. Um, I truly believe that we are all uniquely, you know, you are uniquely you, I'm uniquely me. Um, we are all on our own unique journeys. In a world that is so noisy with all this social media, how do people not just young people, because I know you can talk about youth and that is your, the people you mainly speak to, but I know so many adults that really struggle with this. How do you even begin to hear yourself think? What do you do? Because there's just so much noise. That people don't even know what their own thoughts are. Well, the number one voice I have to be able to take in is mine. And that's not to say that I'm right or my opinions are the best or something that should be followed by everyone. But if I can't hear my own mind ticking over, my own 
uh, thoughts around the world and uh, and my local uh, space uh, emanating from my mind and, and, and really resonating so that I can hang on to them, well, then I, I'm in trouble. So I'm, I'm the number one voice in my world. From that point forward, you have to think, and it's it's a great uh, a little um, test, if you will, or experiment to do. And many of your listeners would have done this, where you simply write me in, in the middle of a piece of paper, and then you just write or draw, I should say, concentric circles around uh, the two letters M E, and then you place the important people in your life. And if you're listening to circles four, five, six as they radiate from me in the centre of the page. Then, then you've really got an issue. To me, it's those couple of inner rings of people who you're really listening to, and then those outer rings, that's just white noise, and you choose if that's fun and flippant and, and uh, I guess, uh, inspirational in point, but more often than not, that's stuff that you're allowing to just sort of move through you and, and in and out the other side. So uh, there are there are people that I really, really value in my life and those people are in my inner circles and they're the ones that I'm really listening to when it comes to the crunch. And that's an activity that anyone can do. It'll take about five to 10 minutes, if that, you'll very quickly realize where the real voices in your life lay. And, and quite honestly, someone might uh, think about their parents and realize, you know what, it's actually my mum's voice that I connect with a bit more than my father's. And that's not a disrespectful uh, outcome for your father. That's just a reality. It's the reality that mum's voice for you at that time or that moment in life is a stronger voice, one that you connect with more so than your father's. So it's just acknowledging that and saying to yourself, right, if mum says something around this, that and the other, then I'm really going to take that in because I value her voice. If dad says something, sure, that's my father. I'm, I'm going to listen to him too. But I might just give a little bit more weight to mums because I seem to connect more effectively in that space. So, again, that's something that could be updated every year, every 10 years, whenever it may suit you, when you just want to look at who are the voices that really count. And I'm sure if either of us did it, Facebook, Instagram, any of these other platforms, Snapchat, wouldn't rate or they at least shouldn't rate in your world. I would like to talk to you about um, mental health, Glenn, and, sure. you know, footy, failure, men, your divorce. Um, talk Sounds about, good. Yeah, about what, what you've dealt with in life and how you've come out of it because it's an issue that so many people are dealing with for various ages these days, and particularly for men, it hasn't traditionally been something that they talk about, but it is becoming more um, acceptable, if you like. Don't really like to use that word, but in place of a better word, acceptable for men to actually talk about their feelings and their struggles. I think you make an interesting point around the idea of not sharing one's failures. I feel like sharing failures and sharing trials and tribulations that we've had in our lives, both male and female, old and young, from every... uh, part of the world is a way in which we really, really develop as human beings listening to these stories. And even if they don't have the Hollywood ending, you can quickly identify mistakes or aspects of the story or life that's being shared that you wouldn't follow as a person or you would like to be able to record in your mind for reference at a later time so that you can avoid some of those struggles, the the trials and tribulations that were mentioned in that particular person's uh, summation of their problems. So for me, I I love the idea of being brave. And and you know what, I almost retract that, not being brave, just being considered and thoughtful enough to want to share your failures because uh, failures, yes, some of them or mistakes, some of them are absolutely brutal and cost you an enormous amount of time, money, energy, uh, physical, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, <laughs> p- people make mistakes. They really do all sorts of mistakes and they're, uh, 
the results of those mistakes can be, as was mentioned, long-term or short-term. You just have to try and find a way forward. I personally am not religious. I don't aspire to anything in that space or find myself under the banner of a god. Uh, I am of the belief that we have one life. I would love to be proved wrong. I would love to come back as a incredible creature in my next life, but chances are if there is reincarnation I'll come back as a one-legged seagull chasing a hot chip so with that in mind I really make it my I guess strict focus to try and live the best life I can and and actually engage and risk risk making a mistake risk failure I'm just not afraid of failure at all what I am afraid of is a, a lack of integrity or apathy if those two aspects have uh, entered my life uh, i'm apathetic for any reason well then there's an issue and if i'm uh, going to compromise my integrity in any way well then there's an issue too they're the issues that i'm worried about failure is not one of them uh, that is something that i'm accustomed to i've failed so many times uh, whether it is within my football space in my relationship space uh, just in my own general health and maintenance, how I've performed as a human being on a and, and daily basis, I've failed. Uh, I, we spoke earlier about giving somebody the bird as they cut you off in a car. Uh, it's not that it's the world's greatest failure, but it probably is a failure nonetheless. There's, there's really probably no reason to do it other than to get your own angst out and feel like you've controlled the situation you've uh, retained some power uh, but let's be honest driving a car especially in modern times is incredibly challenging as everybody tries to get from a to b to c in the shortest amount of time possible and people make mistakes they take risks and errors occur uh, flashing the bird at somebody really doesn't solve anything having said that on a podcast and made a uh, a global statement now will i never do it again of course i will of course i'll make that mistake again i'm not going to beat myself up over it i'm just going to keep trying to refine my behaviors until i get it close to right or as close to right as possible for me so sharing mistakes i think is just fundamental to everyone's success the absolute truth is nine out of ten of the issues in your household i can probably solve in less than five minutes and make you feel like a really ordinary parent but the same could most likely be said for the issues in my household. You could step in there and say, Glenn, why are you doing this? Why are you saying this? Why are you acting this way? It's very, very challenging to be a young person, but it's also really, really challenging to be a parent, a successful parent, a caring parent. It's very easy to be a, a disconnected, disinterested parent, somebody who doesn't want to set benchmarks, who doesn't want to uh, share discipline, who doesn't really care. So as a mum, as a dad listening to this, I think it's a great point that you raise that everyone's household is flawed. Everybody does make mistakes in that space, particularly with their young people, let alone themselves, and that those mistakes are easily fixed by others, but not so easily fixed when you're actually in the melting pot, you're at the cold face yourself. And that's, that, I think, rings true for absolutely everyone. And I know when I speak publicly and I share that, I see a look of angst on an audience face as they're thinking to themselves well, Glenn's telling me my life's poor but then when I flip it back and say look mine's equally poor again you feel a real connection with the audience as they say yeah what so I, I understand what you're saying now you're saying that everyone's going through the same shit so to speak yeah and I think there is um a sense of relief in that because you yes think, oh my god it's just me I'm such a stuffer. What have I done? I've messed up my life, messed up my kids. I don't know where I'm going with school. I, you know, I'm not married yet. I don't have a relationship. All these thoughts and things that people have all across society, so many people are feeling and thinking the same sort of thing. So correct. Like, like you, I am more than happy to share um, a lot of my reality and, and real life struggles in the hope that it relieves some pressure for other people and possibly inspires them in, okay, you're going through it too and you've pulled through, oh, I can pull through as well. And that's the, that's one of the great advantages to go full circle of technology is that we can globally share these stories with one another. I think it's just important to remember that I find the best way to share them is just in an inobtrusive, humble way. 
you don't need to be preaching to someone else and, and trying to demonstrate that you've got the perfect solution or the, the right formula and everyone else must record it and, and act as such. It's more a case of, hey, you know, these are the things that have happened for me and I've made these mistakes and this is how I've recovered. Maybe you choose to follow it, maybe you don't, but it's just an example for you to consider. And I think the people who effectively use tech and communication in that way have the most effective results. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And there definitely isn't just one way and one formula because, you know, correct. we're all different people with some very similar issues. Um, I'd love to chat to you about the Red Hot Chili Peppers song you <laughs> in your book about, and it had me really curious. You talk about the lyric, it's so lonely when you don't know yourself. And I guess this continues on excuse, sort of the, the topic. It's the been- theme. Yeah, it's the theme that we've been discussing this entire podcast and a very worthy theme. I find my playlist to be one of my most treasured possessions. It's a crucial resource and something that I refer to literally every day. My personal playlist on Spotify has close to 700 songs on it. They've all been curated. They're all there for a reason. They all mean something to me, whether it's the music, the lyric, the fact that I might have seen the band in concert, whatever it may be, there's all a, a connective point with each song for me and uh, an evocative reason why I want to listen to that song or at least hold it on my uh, phone or my device so that I can listen to it as I choose. So the Red Hot Chili Peppers, a band that really, for me, uh, almost sprung me forth out of uh, my teenage years into my 20s and allowed me to realise that the world around me didn't have to be black and white, that there are all sorts of shades of grey and that I would find my place within it. And that particular, that particular lyric from the song, Knock Me Down, the album was Mother's Milk, Uh, The trailing lyric, it's so lonely when you don't even know yourself. The song itself is about the death of lead guitarist Hillel Slovak, who died from a drug overdose. And I just remember listening to that song and not being able to appreciate it for what it was in the moment. I wish I was able to because it probably would have saved me a lot of angst in my life. But it just became a bit of a, a quiet anthem in the back of my head that I needed, as I said earlier, to continue to build that knowledge of self and understanding who I was. Uh, and I think the graphic death of uh, a band member of a, of a band that I'd connected with uh, was something that amplified that for me and made me made me appreciate it even more, that this is something that can be taken away from you, this being life, uh, at any time through your own devices and or otherwise. And that loneliness that he must have been feeling, that lack of connection with oneself, uh, is something that stuck with me. And I wanted to make sure that that wasn't something that I experienced to that extent. Yeah, look, um, I think most of us probably would have listened to songs over and over and lyrics that later on we've gone, oh, wow, that's what it means or it's resonated. I can, I can completely relate to that, not that specific song, but mm. the same experience with other songs. But in that chapter where you wrote about that, you also wrote about being in hospital and a doctor saying to you, you're a right joke. Mm-hmm. What was that all about? It seemed like, you know, maybe a dark place in your life or a turning point. Talk to us about what you meant by that. You're a right joke. What did he mean by that? You've touched on a very, very prominent part of my life, a turning point in my life where I managed to cut my right arm essentially in half. And the words that you shared there, you're a right joke, which were shared in a thick English accent, were delivered to me as a 17-year-old by a doctor as I lay in a hospital bed, and he assessed who I was as a person. He'd never met me before. He'd been seconded from the UK, so he was certainly a fish out of water as he addressed me at the foot of my bed in an emergency department holding pen at a hospital that I was taken to after cutting my arm in half. And his summation of me as a person really struck a chord, hit a nerve, and forced me to consider who I was, who I wanted to be, uh, and how I was going to move forward in life. And it was a horrible night in my life, one that I deeply regret, one that should never have happened, although 
given the stimulus that was put forward for that entire year, which happened to be my year 12 year, my final year of school as a 17 year old, uh, it was probably always going to happen because I didn't know who I was. I was out of control. I was, for whatever reason, full of false goals and aspirations, uh, wanting to become something that I wasn't. And again, remembering this is long before social media, so I have nothing else to blame other than my own indifference and my own shortcomings. And his words, that moment, that time forced me to make a, a change in my life. And essentially, the upshot was I promised myself that basically uh, every day of my life, I would do that systems check that we spoke of earlier. And one of the ways in which I would do it is to stand in front of the bathroom mirror and use the colloquial Australian expression, are you fair dinkum, as a face-to-face -face opportunity to ask myself, essentially, am I prepared to be myself today? Will I be me? Is that how I will act? Uh, and I've never been able to... Uh, uh, I guess, better that question. It's as good as it gets, in my opinion. It's a, a stark moment to start my day, which puts me on the right foot because I've never failed to answer the question in any other way other than yes. Today, as tomorrow, as the next, and so on, I am prepared to be myself. And it's a lesson and a direction and a skill set that I wish I'd learned in a much easier way. Uh, a less physically painful way, let alone emotionally and psychologically painful way, but it's a lesson that I learnt nonetheless. Yeah, I think it's um, it's absolutely a fantastic lesson, and even though it was learnt in a physically and emotionally painful way, it sometimes really does take um, tragedies and those sorts of um, experiences in life to give us the big lessons and. What a gift to have had that at the age of 17 because, again, so many people don't have it until a much older age. I mean, my hugest lesson, I guess, um, was when I was already in my early 30s before I made some massive um, transformational change in my own life. So to have that at 17, although painful, what an amazing gift. It is a gift, but at the same time, it's a gift that you have to work on because, as you just rightly pointed out, not everyone's on the same trajectory as you. So you have to try and work through finding people who are on the similar page to you as a result of your experiences uh, so that you can find some connection, some solace, some, uh, I guess, reward for that experience rather than dealing with people who are heading down a different pathway. So it can be challenging because it can create a feeling of isolation at times that you're either behind or ahead of the curve. Uh, but I've been lucky to push through and, and, as I said, identify who I am and continually update that and develop a, a strong sense of my place within the community and the, and the people whom I share it with. So whilst not the only incident in my life, that was the first and my life has been peppered with uh, similar uh, big experiences ever since uh, some of them less painful some of them more painful you mentioned divorce earlier certainly my divorce uh, was something that had an equal effect upon me something that made me really do a, a full systems check if you will and uh, these experiences I have no doubt will continue uh, both to me and people around me and I guess that is a point that we raised earlier that whilst all these experiences mightn't be yours, you can learn from them if you are observational and you also listen. So taking in other people's experiences, both negative and positive, can be a way of furthering your experience as well. Oh, thank you, Glenn. Everything that you have shared has been absolutely amazing. I have one last um, question for our Please. footy fan. Can you tell us like, the best moment in your footy career? The best moment in my football career. Now, that's mo as, most as, impactful. That's Anything as broad like a question as you can possibly ask. Look, <laughs> I was lucky enough to play a lot of football, and by a lot, I mean an awful lot. So I went to the Essendon Football Club when I was 16 and left the Carlton Football Club when I was 31. So there's 
roughly 15 years of professional career there, let alone the fact that after I got divorced, I actually went back and played football again. And football played a very, very important role in my rehabilitation, if you will, or my development, my uh, survival of divorce. So I have all sorts of stories uh, regarding football, which are just plain outrageous from the ways in which coaches and players have interacted and the things that have been said and done and literally anything that I would share on this particular podcast would see people thrown in jail quite honestly for the things that were done and said and the actions portrayed and uh, uh, enacted in a, in a football space back in those times let alone modern times uh, I've been standing on the MCG when the scoreboard caught on fire uh, I've been involved in situations where players are being peppered with hot chips from the stand, which doesn't sound like much, but when the stand's raining down hundreds of hot chips, uh, it's quite a sight to behold. So there's all sorts of weird and wonderful spaces and places and faces from my time playing AFL football. But I think for me, my favourite football memories, and they, it, it probably fits in... Uh, most effectively with this particular podcast are the ones that involve my family, in particular my children. So I was lucky enough to step out onto the aforementioned MCG holding my children in my arms. I was lucky enough to be paraded around grand final day having retired from the game with my children. So those experiences are experiences that literally money can't buy you'll never have the opportunity to do again. Uh, Very, very few players are afforded that luxury or that moment in time to take a snapshot of what they've achieved and enjoy it with their family. And whilst I do feel I probably had children and got married, et cetera, et cetera, at at an age that was uh, probably too young upon reflection. I I had three children and a vasectomy by the age of 30. Uh, And if I had that time all over again, I probably would have just taken my time to develop my fatherhood and my parenthood and that particular engagement with with young people and family in, in a bit of a broader sense. But We did rush in at the time and and try and get everything done before midnight. And it was, uh, in the end, something of an undoing in in the relationship. But in terms of football, it did mean that my children had a chance to share that time with me. And I mentioned going back and playing local football. Well, that really, really heightened it. So in 2010, when I returned to play local football, albeit at at a very high level, I never imagined that I would play the game again, let alone be able to share it in a more intimate way with my children. At the time, my children were 10, 9 and seven so they were well aware of what dad was doing and and well aware of the space that they were involved in and uh, we're still now able to recall uh, the many strange highs and lows of that season a season in which I injured myself in the very first game that I played my eldest son told me and and I quote your shit you can't play to which point you're too old to which point I turned around to him and said mate I was wondering whether I should play this season or not, uh, but you've now given me the motivation to play. I'll go as far as to promising you here and now that we'll go on to win the premiership. And he, I remember him saying to me, Oscar, uh, saying to me, Dad, that's just not going to happen. And then the look on his face on grand final day when we won the premiership and uh, I'd achieved what I set out to achieve and, and had their support and also their Uh, inclination, their fascination to support it with me, to grow that space with me and enjoy the premiership was one that I'll never forget. So any listener who has children would know how beautiful it is and how special it is to be able to share true moments with those children. And as a parent, that's something that you're always striving for. And as a more learned young person, a, a son or a daughter, they're the moments that you look back on too, I think, more often than not and say, yeah, that was a special time when I got to enjoy that with my family, with my parents. Yeah, that's absolutely um, amazing, you know, that he said that to you and that I can only imagine the type of lesson in in faith and belief in yourself when you told him that with conviction after he told you something that, you know, I've had similar sorts of things happen with my own children and they've said some things that I found at the time quite hurtful. Now I'm okay, it's just words, 
yeah, it was a special moment. And the funny thing is, I can honestly say that I knew we would win. As soon as I'd made that comment, I knew we would win because that's the sort of person I am. I am driven to ensure that the things that are important to me, that are special to me, are things that I achieve. And it doesn't mean I have to achieve it uh, with a gold star or with an A+. plus. For those people listening, uh, the premiership that I played in 2010, whilst I played in many AFL premierships, was not an AFL-level premiership, but it was a premiership nonetheless. And that's the point of the matter here. You've set a goal, you've targeted it, you've worked towards it, you've given it absolutely everything you have. That's where the integrity kicks in. Uh, I knew I'd be able to walk away from that season satisfied. And as I said, given the skill level that we had in the team and my own abilities, I knew that we'd win. So it was a really lovely way to cap off not only that year, but a particular time in my life that was troubling. And that's an be- absolutely beautiful note to finish on, you know, the power of um, self-belief and conviction in what you decide that you're going to do. So I thank you so much for your time, Glenn, and everything that you put into the podcast today while we've covered with you through Melbourne. Absolute pleasure. Where can people connect with you? Where can they Look, find you? <laughs> ironically, they can find me on Instagram. Uh, follow me, don't follow me. I'm never concerned about that. But the direct message facility is a great way to take a time out of uh, one's life and touch base with me. So you, should you choose. Uh, my website, which is just simply glennmanton.com.au, is easily found. That's another great place to connect, to have a look at articles, to um, I have, I guess, a more personal uh, interaction with me. But I'm, I'm a very easily found person. So if there is anyone listening who's interested in engaging with me for speaking opportunities or anything uh, of the sort, again, reach out, touch base. You'll always talk with me. You're not going to be talking to a machine or through 20 different managers. I'm a big boy. I can look after my own affairs. So feel free to touch base at any time. And I must say thank you to you and your listeners for putting up to me, uh, putting up to me. Well, you almost had to put up to me, put up with me for over uh, 45, 50 minutes of this podcast. It's really just evaporated incredibly quickly. It's been a pleasure having the conversation. Yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful, the, um, the conversation that we've had. I have personally learnt and thoroughly enjoyed what we have discussed. And I would also include your um, Spotify uh, if you don't yeah, it's called Ozilla, so O-Z-I-L-L-A. I'd be surprised if there wasn't something in there for everyone. There are some uh, pretty off-the-wall musical choices, but there's also some classics in there. And as I said, every single song on that playlist has a purpose and a story. So if you're ever wondering why, don't hesitate to touch base and say hello and ask a question. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Glenn. I hope you have an amazing day. Likewise. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I truly hope you have found it beneficial and have taken some value from it. Hopefully, a lot. If you did, please, please share this show with anyone you feel may need to hear it. I would also absolutely love if you would take a minute or two to review this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever platform you happen to be listening to it on. With your help, we can accomplish my mission to positively impact 10 million lives. That would be so awesome. Now, if you want to connect with me or my guests on other platforms, or if you want to send me an email with questions or ideas of guests to interview, please check out the show notes. I am so incredibly grateful to have had your time today, and I can't wait to have you on the next episode. Have a great day.